I, I want to start by saying I'm clearly at a massive disadvantage because the two of you clearly know each other very, very well, and, and, and I don't know either of you at all. Um, but I really called the unfair advantage. It is. Well, here's what I know. I, I know that you were kind of a a struggling musician who decided to stop being a struggling musician who and and basically become one of the most successful label managers and, and kind of run your own label. Scooter, I know you were a, wanted to be a basketball an NBA player. You were maybe challenged by something genetic. I don't know what it was. Uh, and, and 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 instead, you know, it have become. I don't even know what to call you because you're a manager. You run a label. You invest in stuff. You well, you're wildly I'm, I'm diversified. I'm a five foot eleven Jewish failed basketball player. That's fair. Exactly. What That's fair. Called. So we have a lot of stuff to talk about here. And, and so, Scott, let me talk with you, uh, or start with you, and just ask, I guess, as, as simply as I can, what's your problem with Spotify? My problem with Spotify is free should not be eternal. And what Daniel Ek fails to recognize is he hasn't been a good partner to the community, the, the creative community. Um, he has a, a great service, but there is a free platform that is ad-supported that does not make money, that will ultimately implode upon itself. He's got to find a way to have people to continue to fall in love with the product, but love it enough to pay for it, because music has value. And if you truly value it, paying $10 a month, uh, you should be proud to pay at least $10 a month for all the great music you have. So he's got to understand. Come on, everybody, yeah. So he's just got to understand that if he doesn't support this community, that we're not going to support him. If you don't support him, you talked about how he has to be able to build this business. If you don't support him by doing things like pulling music off of it, can he build that business? Or, or, do, or do, you, do you basically de facto make sure he can't? Well, you know, it, it's, we're not looking to put him out of business. We're looking to have him be a, a better partner because what he's built is, is actually a, a very strong platform. But if he doesn't support us back, we won't be able to afford to continue to develop artists and support what he is building. So, uh, you know, I'm not sure if he's more in interested in just being very wealthy or if he really does care about the music community. Scooter, let me ask you, you, you among other things, have a, a small investment in Spotify. To my <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, why is Scott wrong? Scott isn't wrong. Um, before, when I was in, when I was in college, you gotta let me finish before you boo. <laughs> um, when I was in college, Napster came out and um, the entire music industry didn't have conversations, they ignored them. And uh, they watched technology kick our ass. And that has happened every single time. Our entire industry was actually created by technology. The idea that the radio came about actually made an industry for us to have in the first place. And every single time we try to fight technology, it kicks our ass and it shifts. So the way I looked at it was Daniel was do some, doing something very disruptive. And um, we were on a list, a 30 under 30 list together. And I called everyone on the list, introduced myself, and I met Daniel. And it wasn't in the States yet. We became friends. I saw what he was doing. And I think the best way for me to help Scott win his argument, because I agree with him, and I think for all my artists and the fact that I want content to have value, is to be able to call as an investor in the company and tell Daniel I think he's wrong. And I do that. I say, look, Daniel, you can't. You, I understand you're bringing people in, and he has because he's created this consumer loyalty with Spotify. And even recently, we saw you know other competitors come, and their numbers shot up. Yeah. That being said, Daniel's starting to listen because I'm not attacking him or going at his throat and saying I want to kill you or I'm going to shut you down. When you have an act like Taylor, you can do certain things. You have a, I mean, you, granted, it's a slightly different relationship, but you have some acts that, that could. Oh have yeah, some, absolutely. Some and, and, there. But not a lot of managers or label owners are in the position we are and they can't take their music off Spotify and make a difference the way Taylor can. And I applaud Taylor for what she and Scott did. At the same time, I'm choosing to do a little bit differently of saying, look, we're invested, we're your partner, and we're out there publicly rooting for you, but you need to hear what we're saying. And I can tell you, and Scott does know this, behind the scenes, he's slowly starting to understand that. And it will get to a point where we butt heads, but you do that with your partners. Do you think he, do you think Daniel slash Spotify is being honest with artists when, literally when the checks get cut, do you think they're cutting the checks they're supposed to be cutting? Do you want to answer that first? You want to... Well, I, I think that they are. I don't think there's any lack of transparency. It's just at a, it's a very young platform. And the biggest problem that we have overall is he's trying to say that one size fits all, that everything should be free. Well, when you've created value with an artist in music, those should be in the premium 
uh, platform. And that was part of our conversation. It's like, well, with some of our established artists, why don't you make your premium service more robust and make them available in premium only? And he just refuses to do that and puts everything into free. But what Scooter's talking about is we are making headway. There are a couple of moments. So I think he's heading our way. And you know, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. You know, we have a lot of music that's on Spotify. As far as a promotional vehicle, it's very good. He's just got to understand that you can't have an eternal free ad-supported platform because that ultimately doesn't work. You talk about it as a promotional vehicle, and, and definitely correct me if I'm wrong because you'll understand these numbers better than me, but am I wrong in saying that an artist on Spotify today, you know, not with the, the theoretical premium thing, but an artist on Spotify today gets more per stream on Spotify than they do per view on YouTube financially? And, and YouTube, though, and, and then the argument is, well, YouTube's a better promotional vehicle, so we're willing to take less. It, why is YouTube a be such a better promotional vehicle than something like Spotify that you're willing to take less? You know, if you look at just the different ways of discovery, you know, you can identify by demographic. And Scooter and I were talking about this earlier. The people that automatically, it's in your mind, if you used YouTube as a discovery mechanism, that's probably the first thing you go to for the, the people who discovered on Spotify. And it's like, okay, that's the first thing. Apple Music's biggest challenge right now is becoming that first awareness of, okay, I'm going to go to Apple Music to find it. What Scooter was talking about with radio, radio and what Ari was talking about earlier, radio and television are still the best. They're just not the only ways to discover. Scooter, I'm curious, do you feel what, you talked about kind of some of the stuff you're pushing in Spotify. Do you feel that in general, and Spotify is not the only streaming service, do you, do you believe that in general what the artists are getting right now is fair? You think they're getting too little per stream? I, I think he said it, it's, it's a new platform, it's a new, we're gonna figure it out over the next couple of years. One of the problems, and we're seeing a shift here also, is that as you do business with the licenses, Scott is a label owner. Right. So when they're dealing with him, he's making his deals on behalf of his label. When you're dealing on the management side, and we, a lot of our acts we have on a label, but then a lot of the other acts, they are signed directly to the majors. The majors are having these conversations, they're not including management, they're not including the artists, so there's a, a huge disconnect. And when you're dealing with a creative group of people, they're actually the most collaborative people in the world. You know, if you go to an artist and you're actually transparent with them and you have a conversation to explain to them the long-term thing, they love collaborating. That's the nature of who they are. But when you're not communicating with them, they get very weary. They start to, you know, wonder what is going on. And what's happening is the labels are cutting these deals. The artist community isn't understanding what's going on. They're not getting paid properly through the labels quite yet because the labels themselves well, are still I, on an old system that ask, we're slowly changing. Can I ask about that? Because that, that's the folks, the, the folks who will defend current streaming payments and streaming will say exactly that, say, well, they're giving a lot of money, but the labels are taking the same percentage that they took back when they had to be you it, know, look, pushing vinyl. It's, it's not that simple. What Scott's saying is also the other part of it, which is what they're paying for free, Maybe when you're doing label negotiations is fine and we're getting it, but we need to create better value for content and we deserve it. And the artist community deserves it. And what we're trying to say is if you create, what you said earlier about YouTube, YouTube has now become the status quo. So Spotify is new, so it's not quite the status quo. We are in danger of allowing it to become status quo for free. And right now, because we've seen this happen many times before, we're in a position where the creative community trusts us and tells us to fight for them, and that's what we need to do. They deserve to be paid, not just the artists, but the writers. A after Taylor pulled music off Spotify, did any of your artists come to you and say, is yeah. this something I should be doing? Yeah, they immediately, one of them, I'm not gonna say who, but called me and goes, take my music off Spotify too. And, but, it, but it's still there, did, did well, that it, not it's, happen? It was uh, a different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> different conversation. Right. It's also not that simple because Scott and Taylor control her masters. This one artist who called, has masters that are controlled by her label. And so we've we, narrowed it down now, yeah. a little bit. Not, not enough. We have like seven females that we can choose from. So. Want to give hair color or something? We can keep cutting now? <laughs> All right. Uh, let, let's, I'm going to ask uh, two more streaming questions. One, Scott, let me ask but you. Look, before okay. you get away from that, you've got to understand that the record contracts are dollar in, dollar out. When you're getting 0014 for an ad-supported stream, you know, when you read these stories of artists getting millions and millions of plays and getting a few hundred dollars, that's real. So if we're only getting that much, you're not going to get that much back. And what Scooter said, so important, it's not just the artist, it's not just the label, it's the producer and it's the musicians and everybody involved in the creative community. And so that's why we have got to continue this conversation as loudly as possible 
because all of you are music fans, you go, oh, okay, well, I get it. I'll pay 10 bucks a month. It's really not that much. Can I, I add one more thing? Sure. When you're asking me about why would I invest in something like that, and I kind of explained a certain way, I would love to be someone who grew up in the music industry where I could put out one single, and you had to buy my entire album physically, and you know, go to Sam Goody or wherever it is. I would have been in the. I haven't heard it. the word Sam Goody in <laughs> a long time. I'm saying it, but that's that's my yeah, point. It's, I remember. You know, these guys who are older than me who come to me in the industry, they go, "Man, you got in late, buddy. Sorry." And and you know, I would love to say the industry is different, but. I have to study what I'm given, and what I've seen happen is exactly that. When you fight technology, you lose. You have to adapt. And if you try and stop something, you're going to lose. But the best way to do it is join them and then educate them on what you're, what you're dealing with and have an open dialogue. Exactly, because it's not we're trying to stop Spotify. We're and you not have trying a deal to with stop. Universal, who's also an investor in Spotify. Different yeah. deal, but still a and relationship. So we're not trying to stop it. What we're saying is we know this is happening. We know people enjoy this. And so understand where it is going. Okay, we get it, and we accept it. And the what? But you're going to hear us. Yes. And what the internet has done, it's removed all the gatekeepers. So we can't control distribution. We can't control all of those platforms that not that long ago the major record companies could control. Let me ask one last question about this, Scott, which is specific to you. Can you give me some background? When, when Taylor pulled 1989, her, her last album off, or let me rephrase, threatened to pull it off of Apple uh, Beats if they didn't, if they didn't start pay, tr paying people. Well, it was uh, never on. Thing. Okay, right, but before yeah. they launched. Can you give me a little backstory of that? Was, that? was that your idea, her idea, and if it was her idea, how did you hear about it and how did that conversation go? Well, the conversation started with myself and the executives of Apple just as a label group conversation of, I can't support this, you need to pay us from the first stream. And those conversations were leading up to the weekend where Taylor posted the blog, and she and I hadn't spoken that week. And so she literally texted me, she said, don't be mad with the link. <laughs> and so I clicked through and read it, and I responded back, she was in Europe. I said, you don't have any idea how good your timing is right now. Here's the conversations I'm having with Jimmy and Ian at Apple. And I was set to have a big conference call the next day on Monday, this was Sunday, Father's Day. And through me sending the blog to Jimmy and Eddie and them getting immediate feedback. My conversations with Jimmy and Eddie that day were, here's the good news, you haven't launched yet. You can do the right thing. And if you do the right thing, the artist community globally are going to look at you as the good guys. It's, the, it's a rare opportunity when you could do something for the greater good. So throughout the day, several conversations and by Nine o'clock that night, they agreed to literally pay from the first spin. Were you surprised they caved as quickly as they did? Well, I, Scott and I know some a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes at the time. Um, I think such as I, I, well, I think everyone was fighting that fight. Yes, and um, we weren't alone in that fight. Th there was there was a huge fight going on behind the scenes. Do you think if they had launched the way they wanted to launch, leaving Taylor out of it, that there would have been other artists who weren't there? No, I, I think th you would have heard a lot more about it. I think that Taylor. Um, Taylor pushed it over the edge. And I think that Taylor made them aware that this wasn't just the executives. Sometimes it's good to hear the artists themselves say it. And when Taylor said it, it, it made them realize that the entire artist community is gonna start being very vocal. And Jimmy's whole philosophy with Beats One and everything that they're doing is artist friendly, artist first. And if they didn't do what they did, there would have been a lot of trouble. Let me move on to some other stuff. Scooter, your, your history with Justin Bieber in terms of how you discovered him originally via YouTube it, it is well known and has been talked about a lot. So I I'm, guess I'm curious for you, talk to me a little bit about new artist discovery today for you. How much of that is you personally literally being on things like YouTube or, your, or people who work with you? How much of that is actually going seeing live performance? Can you just talk to me? I'm trying to get an understanding on kind of I mean, it used to be years ago, you know, go to the clubs, go to the clubs, see who's playing, and, and hopefully there's something interesting, or maybe stuff would just walk in the door in a cassette or something. How do you find new artists today? So if I describe it, it's going to sound very cheesy. Um, it's like falling in love. Like, you don't really plan it. It kind of happens. Um, and you just got to put yourself in the best position to meet the right one. Um, so your music discovery Tinder is basically what you're saying? <laughs> I just swipe right and find yeah, the artist. Fair. Um, no, it was, look, that was the right timing. Um, some, you know, I found this girl, Tori Kelly, um, in a coffee shop. I'd seen some stuff and I went and watched her in a coffee shop. Uh, Cy 
we, we did Gangnam Style. It was literally, my buddy Scott, who's here, sent me a video and said, isn't this funny? It had 60,000 views. And uh, I said, we should sign him. And he goes, why? And I wrote, I went to a lot of parties as a kid, and this is the Macarena. This is Khan I Joe. I know what this is. Um, and then, you know, it's, you know, Ariana, it was the same thing. I saw her sing a cover of one of our other artists. Um, so sometimes, um, well, you'll enjoy this one. This one was a random one. Martin Garrix, who's one of the biggest DJs in the world. Uh, he was brought to me by one of the executives in my office. It was actually the old school A&R way. But to sign him and to find him, um, he was on Club Med on vacation with his family in Punta Cana. So I went kind of old school and I called the Club Med and I pretended to be from his school. And he was 18 and I said, this is a school emergency. And they got him on the phone and I said, I'd like to offer you a record deal. And he said, oh, it sounds great, man. And literally like put his dad on the phone and that's how we did it. So it still happens the old kind of cool rock and roll His ways. father wasn't pissed that you had like taken him off the beach so there was a school emergency. He probably sprinted to the phone at Club Med. I've never asked. <laughs> I don't want to know. But uh, yeah, but it's, you find different ways. And I, I will say when I found Justin and I started walking with all these YouTube views, everyone thought I was crazy. Everyone said no. Just so you know, when Scott had Taylor Swift, he got no's from everyone as well. And he and I bonded over the fact that we both had to build both of those artists ourselves. Yeah. Scott was packaging CDs with Taylor in his house, and Justin and I were making YouTube videos in, in my place. So, you know, it's, it's still that organic way. It's the same way my dad would go to a record store and find vinyl. You know, kids are going online and they're having that same sense of self-discovery. That thing music does to us doesn't change. It's about understanding where it is now. So for you, I, I'm similar for you? I mean, kind of an all of the above right now? Yeah, it's... For me too, I either fall in love immediately or don't. Ninety-nine percent of the time. You, can I ask? When you say fall in love, do you have to personally like the music? In other words, does it have to be something that you would put on just you know in your own home when you're hanging out, or does it have to be something you just think you know what that's something that a lot of people are going to like? It doesn't. It doesn't have to be something that actually is something that you like. I don't think about it that much. It either hits me in the gut and knocks me over, or it doesn't. It's very rare when I've had to see something two or three times and go, okay, now I get it. Now that does happen on occasion, but more often than not, when I met Taylor the first time at 14 years old, I'm like, oh my God, this is unbelievable. You kind of know instantly. Yeah, and you brought her into the office after hours, right? So that yeah, your still former colleagues wouldn't yeah. No. This goes back to, uh, it was November 2nd of 2004, but prior to that, I had been contacted by uh, a friend of the family, and they called, they sent me a package, Manager calls and said, hey, did you get the package by Taylor Swift? I said, yes, I did. What do you think? I think it's good. We're going to be in town next Tuesday. Can we stop by? Please hold. Well, I had already been putting a prospectus together to start my own company. I thought, it's probably time I start putting myself first. And so I said, yeah, come by at 7 p.m. <laughs> Everybody at Universal was long gone by 7 p.m. Except me and, and my sister. you still signed a deal with Universal all after this. I love Universal. They're great. Did they love you? They, they signed me I for know a very good deal. So yeah, they're showing their love. That's fair. Um, but the point was, there was a connection that she and I had. And I was leaving. My deal went through September of the following year. And I had already made the decision to start my own label. So November 2nd comes in. She comes in just with her manager. No parents. 14 years old. Savvy. 14-year-old silly to couldn't tell how smart. She, she could go from little girl to incredibly charismatic and already very sophisticated songs and song ideas. And the second song she did was a song called Picture to Burn, which was on our first album. I said, that's a hit song. And I think those 14-year-old eyes walking into Universal Music Group going, this guy gets me. And so I had her play 10 songs. We had a really fun evening. I went to see her two nights later at a place called the Bluebird Cafe. Went to meet the family that weekend. Second meeting with the family, I said, here's the deal. I think you're great. I would love to help you get signed at Universal, but you need to understand something. I'm not going to be there in a year. I'm leaving to start my own label. And they looked at me like, we found the guy that we like and he's leaving. And I said, here's my promise. When I start my label, I will sign you. Let me know. And I left. I'm curious, you have one album left with her under the contract you signed right. when she was 14. Let me see how to put this delicately. When that, I, I'm not going to ask if you, if it, does she still need you? Well, you know what? You know, she's been my best student, obviously. Um, 
And I don't mean you per se, I mean, does she need, uh, does she, does someone like her, and, and I guess anyone kind of in that stratosphere, who, do they need a label anymore? Well, yeah, she I does. I need you, Scott. Well, thank you, Scooter. <laughs> I always have Scooter to fall back on. Um, there, I mean, we were just together on Saturday night celebrating four number one pop hits in a row. You can't do that without the power of, of a great label. Now, obviously, she gives us all the great music and content and engagement to do that with, but it takes a team. You can't do this by yourself. And there's a lot of marketing things, and we still consult on a, a lot of big ticket items together. So, you know, I, I hope that we'll be together for a long time. You confi you're confident that there's going to be another deal? I don't take any day for granted, okay? <laughs> not ever. Like, ever. I'm not asking you to take the day for granted. I'm just asking you. Somebody to got that. I got it. I got it. The, for you, I, I'm curious, Scooter, for you, did you I, I just want, I'm curious about you in general. I, I was with some folks at dinner earlier, and I said, what, from L.A., that what should I ask Scooter? And their answer was, what does he want to be, and what does he want to do? In other words, they, they, are you trying to build the next IMG? What model are you following? They're trying to figure out what it is you're trying to build, because you've got all these different pieces of your empire. Should we tell them about the IPO? <laughs> no. <Yeah. Okay. laughs> Scott and I were going to announce tonight that we have joined companies, and, uh, and we're taking offers. So. Um, <laughs> This would be the room to do it. <laughs> okay, so let me let me ask you in a different way. What do I is be? there something you're modeling? Is there something you're modeling yourself after an SB after? So, in our company, we wrote down what we want to be. One day, my staff kind of did the same thing. They said, "What do you want to be?" And I said, very cheesy again, uh, "I want to inspire the world to try." And I feel like if you come to our office, you see a lot of very young, smart people who I want to give them a platform when they come in, they say, I have a really great idea, we can go after it. And it used to be where I would feel it in my gut, fall over, and that's the only thing I'm going to sign. And now I've had to realize that no one, if you're going to scale a business, no one's ever going to really do it exactly like you. And they're not going to do it exactly the way you want to do it. You have to be OK with them doing it the best way they can. Um, and you got to give people opportunities. So a lot of the acts we've signed now, the newer acts, are acts that my young people have said, I believe in this. I'm going to go for it. Back me. And I'm doing that. With the TV shows, um, one of the executives in our company brought me this guy, and he goes, we should buy his life rights. And I said, I don't really get it. And he goes, just trust me, it'd be a great TV show. And it turned into Scorpion on CBS. Um, same thing with some of the movies that we have coming out. The, you the, say the young guys. I'm wondering, you're not an old guy. I'm 34, you're 30 and there's two people in my company older than me, and everyone else is do you? I'm curious, do you worry, a lot of the people you sign are teenagers. When you sign them, yeah. do you worry at all that, that there's going to be a point where you personally are going to have a hard time convincing that teenager to, to connect with you and sign you're with saying, you? You're saying, you're acting like I enjoy signing teenagers all the time. <laughs> I, when you're 25 and you're like, okay, I'm going to leave this VP job and I'm going to go start my own record label, getting someone 30 to sign to you is impossible. Getting you know, young kids who are understanding that you're going to live the dream with them and just be just as passionate gets a lot easier, and then your reputation kind of starts to create it. But I, I want to honestly answer your question. So he and I talk about life and work balance, and I talk to you about this. I'm enjoying waking up every morning and going after whatever I can go after and kind of building and strategizing and hiring people a lot smarter than myself to figure out how we put it all together. What I'm also enjoying is the fact that I just got married. I have a five-month-old son, you know, we just had. And I'm, I'm playing with house money. Like, I go home at night, I look at my wife and kid, and, you know, what we've been able to do since I started this business when I was 19, I got a really good life. I got nothing to complain about. I'm curious, do you work less now that you've got a kid? No, I'm more laser-focused. I think, I, actually, anyone who's a parent understands that. You don't deal with any of the BS anymore. You actually, I'm more efficient now than I've ever been before. But kind of my philosophy is that I, I want to win because I want to set that example for my son and kind of everything else. But at the same time, as I go through life and, and I do everything that I'm trying to do, I'm not looking at it this, with this anger of if I don't do it, I'm, I'm done or failed. And I'm kind of understanding this fact that I can enjoy it and I can go after it and be aggressive. And are they giving you that look that we need? They to are. They're giving me that. They I saw you that roll look. your eyes. Like, I did roll off. my eyes. I did. I, 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 I love that. I tried to get five and I was yeah. told two. Yeah, you were mad. But I, I think that there's this whole kind of work-life balance. And I've seen it throughout my career. Do you want five or two? But, but no. we're not to, leaving. To answer, to answer in a short, I'm gonna get, you're been, not going to get yelled at after a sign. But that's why we don't end, care. End the rambling. It's very simple. It's, Scott and I have talked about this. If you, if you go at it looking at it that route, 
that you know you, you can actually enjoy it and have fun with it and not be so angry because so many times a lot of people in this room are very successful and you start off saying I want to achieve this and then you get there and then you find yourself in the rat race going over and over and over again I'm 34 years, 34 years old I have an extraordinary life and I'm loving every moment of it so I'm waking up every morning and saying let's see what else we can do is, I'm curious, you, you've said in the past that, that you, and I'm going to mess this quote up, but you said that you, you have some, two minutes. I know, at some point you said you talked to David Geffen and he made a comment to you about how it's not, a, not that it's not about the music, but you shouldn't be in the music business. You're representing musical artists, but you shouldn't No, no, be. David says that to everyone else. Okay. And I finally David. asked him why you don't say it to me, and he goes, because you remind me of when I liked it. Um, but David also tells me no one's going to remember you, no one's going to remember me, so don't care. Do you, I'm curious though, the, the issue, the thing that he says to other people, do you agree with that or is music, is music come first and everything comes off of that? Or no, no? I, look, I think I, I read a book about that man and I saw that music's the fastest way to do so many different things yeah. in entertainment because movies take years. You know, TV shows take Broadway. a long time. Yeah. Broadway take years. You can go in a studio and someone picks up a guitar and a magical moment can happen in a night that could change your life. And there's something very exciting about that. Music, if you look at social media, the top social media influencers in the world are all musicians because they touch us in a very different way. All right, I'm going to ask well, you two I remember oh, one thing, too. Scooter and I are working on our first artist together, an oh. artist named Fancy. And he tracked me down one night. He was calling all day. We had country radio seminar going in Nashville. A ton of things happening. He goes, call me. And Olivia had brought Fancy to you and said, I, I had signed him as a writer. And he was so excited. He goes, no, this guy's an artist. I have a whole vision for it. And from there, we're having so much fun creating this whole environment that's, that's so true to who this guy is. But I think we share this love of the music and of the artists. All right, so I'm a financial reporter. I'm going to ask two very quick questions. One to you. You're an early investor in Uber, among others. This time next year, is Uber going to be a public company? <laughs> ask Travis. You've asked Travis. Yeah, you should ask him, too. What did he say when you asked him? He won't answer me. <laughs> I don't have any money. I, I think it's inappropriate for me to answer, answer that question. Oh, answer uh, question. Actually, let me read. If, <laughs> if they have a great IPO, I'll be very happy. Can I rephrase? Is there an answer to that question? Is there an answer? Yeah, in other words, did he give you a yes or no answer to that, so, that sort of question? Does, if anyone here knows that guy, they know that there's never a yes or no Fair. answer. <laughs> Scott, there was a report late last year, the, the big machine that you guys were looking for a buyer for. It. True? No, what had happened is. we announce is, it here, Scott? Yeah, we're, we're for sale. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, what had happened is our deal with Universal was expiring, and at that moment, I had to go and see what else was available. And so conversations that opened doors created other conversations, but we landed exactly where we had hoped to land, so we have a great new relationship, renewed relationship with Universal. I have stretched the patience of our staff. Um, I really want to thank uh, Scooter and Scott for coming here. Mm -hmm.